Hi, and welcome to another video. Today let's have a look into a library called Retrofit. It's a type safe HTTP client for Android and Java. This is a quite old library. I think it came like in 2013, 14, something like this. Before that, when I started with Android uh, in 2011, then we didn't have Retrofit and we had to deal with HTTP requests in a little bit of a more difficult manner by creating everything by hand with the raw APIs that were there. This video is supposed to be this kind of a longer um, walk through a library or, or a project on GitHub like we did with the Android architecture, modern Android architecture sample before. And I would like to get a little bit into deep details of this retrofit, see how it works, like unwrap the library, let's call it, and maybe understand. So first of all, um, as mentioned, Retrofit is basically an HTTP client um, and we have here used it on Android. Um, here is some introduction section and you can see that first of all we define this public interface and here they call it a GitHub service because we will be getting something out of GitHub repos um, API. Here we just specify a simple get call, so this will make an HTTP get call and this is the path probably um, and then we have a call, definition of a call. Um, and we want to get a list of some repos. So repos, I presume, is a type that we define ourselves. And then we have this method called as a list of repos, and we also give it some path parameter user, which is a string. So here we have a path specified to this API endpoint, and you can see that in the path we have uh, probably a user ID over here, or a username. And this argument, by using this add path annotation, should be then injected into into this path when this is actually executed. At this video I will make a couple of assumptions, so I will try to explain a couple of concepts in the library itself, but things for example like the REST APIs, I will just assume that we are already all familiar with it. Okay, then after we have this interface, so we don't create a concrete class that will implement this interface, so this must be taken care of for us somehow by the library. Um, then we have this retrofit instance and we have a retrofit builder. This is just a builder pattern over here. And then we have some methods on it, like here we are calling base URL and we are giving it some base URL to the API. So now it's, in our case it's a GitHub API. So here we are building an instance of, of retrofit. And then out of this instance we create an instance of our service. So some instance of this interface will be created for us with this dot create method here. And then finally, somewhere in our code, we can do this call over here, service.list uh, repos, and we give it a username over here. And what will happen under the hood is, we'll have an HTTP call with the path combined this with this, with the argument from here injected over here. And we end up with getting some response, which will be a uh, call and then it has a list of repos, so this call probably has to be get executed, we will see. Then they also explain a little bit how to use this library, so we have get of course for get calls, um, and here we are returning a call, I think it's coming from the OK HTTP library, but there are also different ways we can return different kind of stuff, and this will be handled for us with this library. Of course we have posts over here, so we can get, we can post, and in case of post as arguments we should supply these fields over here. Um, because if we have a post request then we have some body inside of this body, then we have form URL encoded fields. Of course a body of a post can hold different kinds of data, it doesn't have to be just some values uh, of a string, uh, like the form URL encoded, it also can have some JSONs and stuff. You can see that we're using annotations here heavily, so also for headers we can specify annotation for a specific header that we want to pass with a specific call. And they also give you some, some information on the synchronous versus asynchronous, so the call instances can be executed either synchronously or asynchronously. And this is the important information over here that on Android um, callbacks will be executed on the mine thread, uh, on the JVM callbacks will happen on the same thread as the executed HTTP request. And on top of that, we also have to remember that on Android, um, by default, we are not allowed to do network calls on the mine thread, so um, we will have to actually call it on some other thread. Then down here, we have a retrofit configuration section, 
where they are telling us that retrofit is a class through which the API interfaces are turned into callable objects. Um, by default, retrofit can only deserialize HTTP bodies into HTTP bodies, uh, response bodies, so it's an object that we get by default. And OKHTTP OK is another library which is coming from Square, so retrofit is coming from Square and they also made this OKHTTP OK library, which is like a lower level lower level kind of client to, to an API. So it's basically the same thing, just on a lower level. And then retrofit uses OK HTTP uh, internally. And so it's using this response body, for example, object. By default, it only can accept this um, response bodies for the type for body. But we can have different converters which can be added and used and then with these converters we get support to all other kinds like for example if you're using json for your json then you can just use this converter that they tell you here or if you use moshi for example also pretty popular as far as i know then you have this moshi converter and then instead you can get just um, responses for json or for moshi or for other types so even simple xml over here so in case your response will be an XML, you can use this uh, to, to convert the response into XML. And here they give you an example how to use a JSON converter factory. Um, factory is another design pattern. Um, <laughs> if you've ever studied software engineering or, or computer science, and or, or you are studying now, then please don't skip the design patterns because it may not seem that important at first, but actually then in, in the real world, especially in the mobile development, you have patterns used everywhere, especially things like builders, factories, um, observer pattern that we looked in another video at, things like that. So a factory is also a design pattern and it's just creating objects for us. So, so it gives us an instance of an object with some configuration and you can have a couple of factory methods and its method will construct this object in a different way for you. So here you can see that they say that we generate an implementation of GitHub service, so there is some generation happening for us. And then this interface uh, uses a JSON, if we are using the JSON converter factory for its deserialization. So the data will be deserialized with JSON library. And how to do it? It's as simple as we have this again retrofit um, instance which we build with our builder uh, design pattern. And on this builder design pattern, we so so it's different from factory because we are building an instance of retrofit, but then with this extra chained methods, we specify what should be included with this retrofit when it's actually built in the end with the build method. So we specify the base URL again and then we add some converter factory which is in this case json converter factory and you have to call create on it so it already creates you um, the json converter here and then finally again we have this create method on retrofit which gives us a service which we can then call to make a request to api then down here we can see we have um, how to include this into our project so if you are using maven then we can use this if you are using gradle then just include this line of code implementation for retrofit and a small information we need to have java at least 8 which shouldn't be a problem and we also need to have an android 21 minimum so the most important <laughs> turning point in android uh, apis at least not necessarily in the ui and stuff just to have a context um in case we think of in, in a layered kind of architecture here i have a picture of a clean architecture but it can be any kind of a layered architecture and so the retrofit library it sits basically in the data layer or in the layer for all the io interactions like we have here devices db web welcome to my android studio setup and here is the project and that's all there is um, this is an exciting point because this is the point when we kind of like unwrap presents <laughs> So we will actually have a look what this repository contains um, and what what it how it works basically a little bit at least up to some time constraints. Here are some information how to release the next version of the library. Okay, so let's keep this information. They're not really very relevant for us. But what's important is basically these directories over here. We have one directory or a module which holds retrofits source code 
and this also comes with tests for Android, for Kotlin, and for uh, Robo VM virtual machine. So Robo VM over here is a ahead of time compiler for Java bytecode, targeting Linux, Mac OS, and iOS. So like for Android we have Dalvik, for example, then for these platforms we can use this RoboVM and then we can still use Java and, and this retrofit library on these platforms. And then we have the source directory over here and we have some test helpers and then we have a couple of other modules. And here we have some adapters, we will look into adapters later. We have converters again, we will look into it. And we have some retrofit mocks. And finally we have a, sam a, a directory with samples, so let's have a look at some of the samples. Let's maybe try this last one, sample over here. And there is not much happening here, more than we've seen in the documentation. So we have some API URL over here. What this sample does is it also connects to the GitHub API and we get contributors apparently. So contributors to a repository of a certain owner and with, with the repository name over here which is a simple get call, uh, which is using this call over here defined on, on retrofit, two parameters, two path parameters, and then we have the mine function over here. So you can see already that this example and probably all of these examples are detached from Android. So if we come from Android um, environment, you can see that this library can be used just in plain Java. We don't need to have Android setup. Again, we have this um, retrofit.builder, so we build the retrofit instance and it's exactly the same like in the example earlier. Then we create it, um, then we call to get the contributors, we get an instance of a call and then here is something uh, important, so when we get this instance of a call, then we have to execute this call. We have this execute method and then we take a body out of it and then body is basically list of contributors. Now here they didn't catch any errors but there can be some exceptions thrown so you should also use some try catch around it. But here they are just assuming everything will go well and um, we just print out the contributors for a repository in question. So there's a couple of other examples as well. Um, so that was a simple service. We have simple mock service. A bit more complicated setup over here. Uh, ah, because because instead of doing a good, let's see an example of using mock retrofit to create a mock service implementation with fake data. Okay, so that's helpful for testing where we have some mock GitHub over here class which is which implements the interface. Okay. So we have this interface specified as before, but this time instead of um, having Retrofit create an, a service for us out of this interface, then we can just extend it and then we can provide some data and then we add it somehow. Let's see how we add it to... Okay, here we are using actually the simple service um, example we've seen before. So from that we get certain data and here we have the mock retrofit um, and this time we call builder on the mock retrofit uh, and we're passing a retrofit instance to it. So it works the other way around. So because um, if we have a look into this builder, it gets yeah an instance of retrofit if it's a null. Remember that we are working here with Java. These are not Kotlin files, they are Java files. And in Java there is no null safety still. So we always have to check whether something can be null even though it looks like it potentially would be non-nullable in other languages. And then we assign this um, retrofit. So we have a variable over here, private final retrofit. And then we are using this somehow to create a mock retrofit here, for example, in the build. Okay. So create this mock retrofit, which is this. And then instead of a uh, just a retrofit instance, we have a mock retrofit instance where we can get the retrofit out of it. And then on create, we have some behavior delegates. I honestly don't know what happens here in the detail. So this is coming, okay, so this is coming from this retrofit to mock package. 
and then this delegate, I will assume here that this delegate just will run our mocked methods instead of the actual methods mm, that would otherwise be called. So here is basically how it works um, with this setup. You can easily mock your test. Then we have an example with Alex Java observables on a mine thread over here, they say. So in that case, yeah, we have some call adapter. Where is our retrofit maybe created here? Is it? Ah, here. So in order to use Rx Java, we have these two adapter factories this time we have to add. So we have this base URL example, and then we are adding some observe mine call adapter factory with observe on, and we want to observe on computation or on mine thread for Android. So I guess in Java we don't have a mine thread like on Android because mine thread in Android is the Android mine thread. Um, adapter factory, Rx Java adapter factory, which will adapt um, the response bodies and stuff for us. We've created some scheduler on I.O. So this, this will run on I.O. over here. Here is our observe on mine call adapter factory. So if you would be interested how to implement your own factory, they show you over here. So we just extend this call adapter dot factory. In this case, we have some scheduler on which we want to run, probably, or, or which we want to have to schedule. And we get some get method which is overridden from the call adapter factory interface or abstract class. Not sure, no. Let's have a look. It's an abstract class, okay. And this gets some return types. And here is so with this return type. Um, it's a little bit more complex, maybe if we look a little bit into the code in a moment of Retrofit. So Retrofit is using reflection over there, so it's able to inspect and work on the code itself on runtime. Um, if you don't know what reflection is, then I highly encourage you to have just a little look into how it works. So we are working with types basically, and then we just check. We have this method get row type, um, and this is coming from Retrofit itself. And then Retrofit defines for us something like extract the row class type from type. So for example, we're getting a type that is a list of a runnable or of any runnable um, implementation over here or extension. And instead of this list uh, of a runnable type, it will return as just a list type. So, so the, without the generic type supplied over here. But again, let's not get too much in details with to, into this because reflection, this kind of stuff, um, it's definitely a topic for another video. This is what we have to do. So we get this get method, then we also have this call adapter over here inside of the factory that we have to define. So this is what is getting built. And then this just has this method adapt, where we adapt something to something. So in this case, we have this call from Retrofit and then we are adapting it to some object um, in this case. So we have an observable and observable we call observe on and that's actually what's getting returned from this adapt method. So there's a couple of other examples um, for, for different use cases uh, and you can have a look into that on your own maybe because we have to look into the code a little bit. But in order to look for the code maybe let's go into this simple service example and let's start from this point. So as we mentioned before, we will have this interface that we have to define that we are later calling. Here we also are defining our own data class, um, just in Java public static class contributor with two fields and a constructor. If we think in Kotlin, then this would be basically a data class. And then finally, we have our Letterfit instance that we are building with a builder and design pattern. Let's have a look into the builder then. So builder is defined as a public static final class inside of a retrofit. So it's kind of like an inner class over here. A builder, what it does, as I've mentioned before, it basically creates for you an instance of something by specifying different properties for it. So you could have a huge constructor with many, many different arguments and you could just uh, instantiate this huge constructor with many arguments and in Java um, could be could be really tedious, especially without all the named parameters. And instead we can have this builder, builder uh, class, which will basically have a couple of methods that we call on it. Then it keeps everything that you pass to it in some fields, internal fields. And in the end we have some build method, um, which is defined 
over here at the end. And this method will take everything that you passed. If it, there need to be any mappings, transformation and so on, then you will do it in the build method. And finally, at the end, you are returning like over here an instance, what you want to build. In our case, it's a retrofit instance that we are building. So we have this return new. In Java, we have this new keyword, like in past, we also used to have in Dart, for example. And we can completely skip in other languages like <laughs> Kotlin. But we have a couple of different setters and possibly also getters over here. So we have, for example, client. And client is just an HTTP client that it is expecting. So you can see now that it's uh, using the HTTP under the hood if we provide it. Then we can add a call factory. Um, we, can add, we can set the base URL on. Probably we have to set the base URL and also cannot be a null. Here is this objects that require not null method call, which ensures basically that, that this type is not nullable. If we have a look inside, then you can see that uh, implementation over here basically returns if the object is null, the no pointer exception, a very infamous exception in Java. Um, then they say this is the billion dollar mistake or something, which, which potentially is true because we've seen a lot of problems with it over the years. And otherwise it just returns you an object. And then the whole method just returns you a builder again, just it's using another method. So we have a couple of different ways to supply the base URL. Here we are supplying it with an URL object and it's just calling to string on it. And we also use this HTTP URL that gets to get actually the base URL, which under the hood is using this method with HTTP URL object. And this is what finally sets that object um, as an URL to use in the end by retrofit. And then we also have like this add converter factories that we've seen at adapters. Um, so, okay, not factories, but one factory. But internally we have a list of the factories uh, for adapters and converters. And you can see that we are just adding this element to the list. And we also check that they are not null because we cannot accept a null over here. One thing that you can notice over here that each of these methods, they're basically setters, but they are returning you a builder. And thanks to that, we are able to chain these methods in this way. Now in Kotlin, of course, we, instead we would use apply let and the other handy methods. And as well, for example, in Dart, if you have an implementation that you can use these two dots um, kind of convention to just call methods on it, but in Java, we don't have these handy methods and therefore we have this kind of an API to, to chain methods and not call the builder dot builder dot. Okay, then if we keep scrolling, there is more of the setters and finally we have the build method um, over here. And let's try to have a look quickly what build does. So first of all, we make sure that base URL was set. If it was not set, then we just threw an illegal state exception because we just cannot not have a URL to call an API. Then we are getting some platform and this platform.get it's implemented on retrofit and it returns us this um, private static final platform which creates for us a platform or defines what platform we are running on. So here we are based on the property of a system JVM VM name. Uh, so we have Dalvik, so this is for Android. Then we have this Robo VM for other platforms that we've seen. And default is just Java. Java 8, the Java 16, Java 14. Um, yeah, apparently there are differences between them for retrofit. But also you can see that there are some differences probably for Android 24 and 21 that retrofit cares about because if 24 is supported, then it wants to know that we are running on 24 or higher. Otherwise we run on 21 or higher and 21 is of course the lowest possible. And so you can see here that Java 8 is also the default one, um, the lowest possible version. Then the next time we have our urge, we have our awk HTTP call factories over here, which is com which was com which is coming from this collection of factories that we had. And in case this is null, so a factory a call factory was not set, um, then we are creating an awk HTTP client. So this is the default for um, for retrofit. You could set something else, but if it's not set, then by default an OK HTTP client will be used. And yeah, we will make all the calls through this client. 
here is the implementation of OKHttp, OK but I think we could skip it for today. Let's just quickly have a look into the documentation here. What does it do? So this is how an OKHttp OK client works under the hood. Um, it also has a builder. Um, we can add interceptors to it. So in case we want to change, make a change, for example, for headers on every request that we make, then we can have an interceptor. Like here they are using, in this example, HTTP logging interceptor. So every time you make a request, then this logger will be called. It has some callback and um, in this callback you can log an information about the current HTTP request. They also show you that there are some capabilities to cache um, calls, set some red timeout and stuff like that. Yep. But again, OK HTTP, super cool thing, but for another video. Then we have some executor, which is a callback executor. So this executor will execute callback um, probably on some thread. So we can see that this is coming from Java util concurrent. So this is our typical executor. So then we can probably define on which thread with this way we can we want to call our callback. And again, if an executor wasn't supplied, so if it's a null, then we take a default. And now you can see why we need the platform here because we get a default executor um, from a platform. And we have a look into here. Then for example, for Android 24, the default callback executor over here is just the mind thread executor that instance. So this way we know that by default, um, the callback will be executed on a mind thread. And then we make a defensive copy of an adapters list. So defensive copy basically means that um, we don't want to have somehow possibility for two different um, instances or in, in two different places uh, for this list to be changed at the same time or, or to get any problems with it. Let's see here. So copy constructors and this defensive copying. What is a, a copy constructor? Can someone share a small example that can be helpful to understand along the defensive copying? Um, principle. Here's a good example. So we have some point, the point has x and y and note that the constructor point um, takes a point um, and makes a copy of it. That's a copy constructor. Yes. So we have another constructor over here which uses this constructor and it makes the copies of the two integers, the x and y. And this is defensive copy because the original pointer is protected from changing by taking a copy of it. So in other words, if we would have this um, point constructor and we would have an instance of a point over here, then if... So, so a, a reference to this point could also exist outside of the point class somewhere. Um, or if we would have another class which takes a point and keeps a point inside because well, it's a point that has a point. So if we would have in another class this point and we would change this point outside of this class, then because the class holds a reference to a point, then change to a point, this, this particular point outside of a class would also make a change inside of a class. So in other words, the value of the point could change inside of a class without the class being aware of this change happening, which leads to a problem. And that's why we need this defensive um, copying. So this is actually another int uh, which sits another in another place in the memory over here. And so similar thing is done here. So basically um, they take this call adapters factories and they have a array list over here um, with all the adapters again. And then the same thing happens for converters over here. And finally, when we get all our adapters and converters, then we have um, here this converter factories uh, list or array list with a specified size and we add them all together and finally we pass it to retrofit as an unmodifiable list. So if you don't know what unmodifiable list is, so a normal list is a list that you can add elements to, but if you have an instance of unmodifiable list then you can no longer add elements to that list. If we have a look into that you can see that it just returns you an instance of a list interface, um, but actually 
it's a collections dot unmodifiable random access list over here or just unmodifiable list over here depending on whether you want random access this list is of a random access or not and then basically we supply all the other uh, elements here to the retrofit instance as well and then if we have a look into retrofit itself so a constructor takes this ok http call factory the base url as http url object and we have all the other parameters defined over here and assigned to our values in constructor and then um, on the retrofit we have this create method which will create a callable instance for us of a service so we can pass something of a type class over here um, which is a service and now here is some magic happening so first we validate that the service interface is an interface basically it's what i guess what this method will be doing let's have a look into that it's defined down here and notice here that we have this type class which is a service and we check if it's an interface and by having this negation over here if it's not an interface then we are throwing an illegal argument exception that API declaration must be interfaces basically if it's not interface it's not an interface and we don't accept that going forward we have also some kind of a check here we have an RU RAD queue which which is basically a queue um, just DQ is um, double ended queue or forgot now what exactly the name is but basically means that it's a queue where you can append new items or remove items from both sides of the queue so from first item you can remove at first item and the last item as well and then we have here this check we are adding our service to the check and then this is an interesting thing look we have a while loop that is going through this check um, which is a queue until it's empty but at this point we have only one element and then if we look um, further into that we have candidates we remove that check um, so we have that class over here that we supplied to to this method so far it doesn't look um, um, like it make my, ma makes much sense but um, let's just have a look further so then on the candidate we check if um, get type parameters length is not zero so this interface also should have some type parameters and if it doesn't have any type parameters then we are just um, having here a message sorry if it has um, parameters then we are creating this message type parameters are unsupported on um, candidate on this type which is an interface of something yeah so actually no we don't want to have any type parameters and in the end if we have any type parameters then we are throwing an illegal argument exception with this message that was built with this stream builder over here and then finally at the end over here we have this collections and we add all to this check so to this queue so queue is of course implementing the interfaces that collections can work on so we can do it and then we are adding candidate so this check that was passed here the service all the interfaces that it may have so what i think is happening here is then that that this interface can Im be implementing other interfaces and then we also want to run this check for all the interfaces it's implementing or, or extending in order that they also have some parameters and if they have then we still throw an exception we don't allow that it looked quite pointless at the beginning with this loop but now it makes a lot of sense and then finally we have this flag validate eagerly so if we want to validate something not sure exactly what we try to validate here but if we want to validate eagerly something then it happens at this point which is um, platform we get a platform again so for example our android 24 platform and then we get our declared me declared methods with reflection over here and then we go for each of the method and we check if we check if it's a default method on the platform or, or is it static is it not static okay not a default and not a static 
and if it's neither default or null static then we are calling this load services methods over here so it's probably I can early check and if it's not done here then it's done later somewhere else maybe or maybe when we actually call the interface and then this load service method gets a method um, and then we have some cache over here we try to get a method from that cache oh. I'm not really sure what happens here, what is this? it's just a map so this cache is a map mm. concurrent hash map and yeah so we try to get this method out of this concurrent hash map if there is some result then we return the result and if there is no result then we assign it to the cache basically so we in other words we just fill in this um, map the cache map over here with this uh, method on every method that we basically get over here and that is not the part and not static yeah so we're back here and they on create in the create method so we went through this and finally we return from this and now we have some proxy now proxy is another mm, design pattern so I encourage you to go to Wikipedia and check it out it's it's basically the same, same proxy as if you have for example in your internet settings so you, you're just passing it through something um, through a proxy and then we create this new proxy instance over here um, we, some, we have some class loader then we have a new class oh there you go here we are creating a class out of this interface that we passed so we we create our interface we pass this interface um, type to retrofit and this is where finally retrofit is creating an instance that will find that will in the end be returned for us just it's going through this proxy over here and then also we have some invoke method on it which gets the proxy object which gets some method and then from method if we get the declaring class if the class is type of an object um, then we can then we can invoke a method yeah but basically without going much deeper into this code what happens here is to the create we pass our interface this interface is then instantiated so there, there is an extending class created and there is some functionality probably added to it that when we call the interface later that it will actually execute a call for us or, or will at least return a call for us that we can execute ourselves so on the retrofit class over here yeah we get a couple of other um, methods next response string converter returns a converter okay so we have some also methods to get different converters on it and finally down here is the builder implemented which we had a look into before so that's about the retrofit class that about the builder and how it's all created over here so at this point we get an instance of a github so it's not interface of course because we cannot instantiate an interface and this is the object which is a class that was returned out of this create method and then next thing we do we just call a generated body of this contributors method somehow um, that was done by retrofit for us and then this will proceed with calling um, with creating the call and so the call um, as we I, I think we already looked quickly into it so it's basically an interface again which takes one type and this type is basically a successful response body type so let's say we we want a string from the api so there's basically a string or anything else so a call is an invocation of a retrofit method that needs um, a request to wherever a return a response and each call yields its own http request and response pair because of course when we make an http um, request um, then, then we have a response um, so it's not much happening over here and then this call is also extending a clonable so it can be cloned 
here we have the clone method um, which has to be implemented by the actual instances um, implementations of call and we have the execute method which is synchronously send request and return its response okay so we have on the call we have the execute method which we call which we've seen in the example and this will actually call um, the API or at least will schedule a call to API depends on the implementation and then from this we want to get a response okay so if we want to get a response and actually we don't schedule then we're actually executing the call here and then we also can have um, IO exceptions on it and we also have runtime exceptions on it then we have an NQ method which is asynchronous okay so now in case you want to asynchronous call then we use the NQ and for synchronous we use execute and then we also have methods like is executed so we can check whether a call was already executed mm, probably not to execute it again or for whatever else is on and we can also cancel over here check if it was cancelled and we can also access the original request and then just play around with a request and the request over here it's just the awk http free request class and it holds things like the url the method headers body and tags so in case we need to inspect anything of it then we can call the request on the call get the request and inspect what we ac what was actually sent let's say that you're coming to some complicated project without a structure without an architecture um, and you don't know there are some calls happening and you don't know what is actually happening you can get this request either this way from some call which was i don't know passed through a thousand different classes and you lose track of it or you could also do similar things in the intercepts probably and finally we can also get a timeout um, so a request can have a certain timeout for example five seconds and if it doesn't complete it complete in five seconds then it will get cancelled and we also can get what the timeout is out of this object let's see some implementations maybe what kind of implementations we have over here we have some behavior call the third call so probably a call that happens later we have an empty call what is this is there any documentation on it nope so an empty call um, okay it's it's just throwing an exception um, yeah so i guess in case we want to just um get a call maybe in a test that throws an exception i believe looks like it's just kind of a mocked um, version of the call let's see what else we have and we have a fake call here and we have a fake call oh, okay now you can see that this this empty call i didn't notice that it's actually defined on the factory test so so it is a mock but also there is some fake call over here which is on retrofit to mock and actually these two also are defined on the mock so well if you want to test the calls then you can use apparently all this already predefined mocks and fakes and stuff and finally down here we have the http call ok http call or ok http call <laughs> not sure and this is the actual implementation then of a call i believe we have a constructor again we get a couple of arguments we have some request factory to create a request for us um, we get a bunch of arguments that are passed to the call we get a factory for the call again and also some response converter um, so i would assume at least that retrofit is also passing finally a converter uh, over here to convert the response body into some type like json for example this awk http call okay it's actually implemented on retrofit here i would so that would be probably the converter you want to use to pass the response body here to some data and let's see if it's used in this class anywhere or okay we have an awk http call instance here which we are cloning so is it also okay so it's a call so it's also a clonable object because call was extending or implementing clonable so we have um, to implement the clone method over here then we have the request method and we just have this get row call and we get a request out of that and this method is defined down here 
and this thingy yeah it gets some raw coal which is a field on this class now if it's a null again we return so here are the refrowing re previous failures if there isn't uh, if it isn't the first attempt so if you had some failures before and you call um, this again then you just refrow whatever was there create and remember either the success or the failure and then we have the NQ method for the asynchronous if you remember calling so in case of asynchronous call to an API then we need to get the response somewhere and we get the response in a callback we have a callback over here of a type T this is synchronized okay so here we actually use the threading APIs for that we check if something was executed here and if it was executed then we throw an illegal state exception so every call can be executed only once in this way and then we get call we get failures and now if we if both of them are null then we are trying to create raw call and assign it to a call if it's cancelled for some reason then we cancel it otherwise we call nq on this call so um this class is an implementation of a call but it also have a call inside of it you can see here yeah so a call holds a call so it's like a proxy for a call and then finally in this call in this nq we have we are creating this OK HTTP callback and this callback is coming with on response method and on failure method and then so on failure will happen for example if mm, if there is no network so if you make a call but network cannot be reached or the server cannot be reached whatever if you get um, no response at all then that's a failure and then in this case you just call a failure um, on the other callback yeah so again we are kind of proxying we have one callback and inside of this callback or not proxying delegating here work maybe and then we call on failure on this callback that was actually passed to to this call and then yeah we can throw if fatal if this throwable is fatal then we can throw in the catch otherwise we just call on failure and we just give it um, some parameters and then on response we also can have a failure um, and if, if something didn't work over here then we also can throw throw as well as on parsing response so this was successful in a way that we got the response but for example we cannot parse the response because it got malformed it can happen sometimes it's very rare but when, while traveling through through the internet the response could for example get malformed there are other also other reasons why parse response could be not possible it's just in a different format than expected or whatever then of course in this way we also can throw and we call failure so you can see then the failure on the original callback is still called and um, the same thing happens over here wait no and here we have finally the response on a callback and this is something that we would not expect over here that this was uh, th this would potentially also throw on calling on response on here but of course it can for some reason and then we also want to catch it and they are printing the stack trace um but also potentially throwing it if at all let's see into that so throw if fata is basically taking a throwable and if a throwable is an instance of virtual machine error so apparently we can <laughs> get a virtual machine error i think implementing this library was was a very long process for this kind of edge cases that otherwise you wouldn't think of like we can get an error from the virtual machine if i would be implementing this library from scratch and um, then I, i'm pretty sure i wouldn't think of this edge case at the beginning and then there would be some issue on my github repository and we would have to take care of um, things like virtual machine error threat death okay this is more likely in, i mean something i would think of maybe but then we have some linkage error as well um, which also will throw so in case of these three types of throwables 
we want to throw because we consider them fatal. Okay, I think um, at this point we can stop looking into this uh, call call classes, ok, HTTP call and stuff. We are actually in utils at this moment. So let's have a look into the retrofit project just for a moment. And you can see that here in the retrofit repository we have defined some lots of annotations. First of all, for headers, get, post, and so on in the HTTP uh, sub package. Internal, um, we have something, some, everything is <laughs> null. What is this for? Uh, I don't know. Let's skip that. Then we have the built-in converters, which we've seen before in the retrofit builder being used and attached. So um, first, let's maybe have a look at the converter itself. So it's an interface, um, and it converts, as you would imagine, objects to and from the representations in HTTP. So we have a representation in HTTP, like I don't know, a response body, uh, exactly a response body, like here or here. And then we convert it one way or another to some type, like an integer, probably, or something else. So this abstract factory, generally, um, if you implement it, then we have uh, two-directional mapping. We can call it mapping. So it's converting, but you can think of it as a mapping also. If you think in the layered architectures, where you have to map from one layer to another, then you have some data object, you map it to domain object, and so on. So this is doing the same thing just with response body to whatever type you want, which can be a string, float, whatever. And back here, we have just implementations of this converter. So we can have a void um, response body converter. So in case the response body is supposed to hold nothing, then we can also convert it to unit. Here we have a converter for a request body as well. So request body to request body. I'm not sure what it, we need it for, but, but we have it. And these are the default converters, and I'm pretty sure that we should find somewhere also converters like to float string and things like that. Here are some optional converter factory. Here is, oh, here is the optional converter itself. Okay, now we see. So an optional converter, <laughs> now I get it, is basically a converter. Uh, so targeting API 24, so I assume we have specifically for Android this. Um, only added to optional in available. Okay, so only in Java 8 and Android 24 here. So in Android 21, we, we which is supported by this library, we cannot use it. But basically, we have this optional type which can hold a value or it doesn't have a value. So, so it's just a converter that takes care of the optional. And I'm pretty sure somewhere we had the other converters, but I cannot see it right now. How about we go quickly to the retrofit class, which is here. And in the builder, so we have the builder again, and down in the build method, um, we had this call adapter factories. Okay, so built in converters here, um, and let's see into built in converters. So that's what we looked at, and then we have the default converters, which are coming from platform. Okay, so the uh, create default converters from platform. Let's see if there's any implementation for that. Android 24. And here, for example, ah, here we have the optional set for that. Hmm. But how do we convert some primitive types, for example? Do we have like int converter? Ah, there we go. In Scala response body converters, where do they sit? Okay, so they actually sit somewhere completely else. So we have this retrofit converters. Ah, now we get Now we get it. So we have this other module over here, which is the retrofit converters. And inside we have just defined all the other converters. Aside from this very basic like void unit and apparently optional as well. And in here, for example, we have an implementation of, of a integer response body converter, where we have a response body integer and in the convert method, we do very little. So we are just basically mapping um, this value. So the response body, which is a value here, we take a string out of it, 
if you look into it. We have a buffered source and then from that source we just get we just read a string with some hard set. And then we return it to integer value of which is basically passing the string to an integer. And then we have converters for different types like long, short, float and so on so on. And more complex converters, so for example this JSON converter that was used somewhere. Mm, we have JSON converter factory over here. And JSON request body converter. There we go. So this takes um, some type into a request body and this time to convert um, it's using the JSON wrapper, uh, JSON writer over here. And we just write to some adapter, to a type adapter. And finally we create some, okay, so we here, here we are parsing um, to request body, yeah. So to request body and here we are parsing request uh, response body to a type. Um, so let's see how this works maybe. So we get a JSON reader and we read basically, we get this reader from JSON library um, and then we try to read from the JSON reader. Here we can pick um, and if something's wrong like we have, we don't have end token um, then we throw that the JSON could not be fully consumed. So if JSON is malformed, then we want to throw here. And finally, we just return the result um, from the read method, which will be some JSON object or whatever it returns. Mm, yeah, it gets a JSON reader and it's a type. So whatever type we want to be read out of it with JSON, whether it's array, whether it's an object or whatever. So that's the converters. And we also have these adapters. Um, what do we have? We have Guava adapter, we have Java 8, RX Java, RX Java 2 and 3. Let's have a look at RX Java 3 just quickly because I think this video is already getting way too long. So in here um, we have here RX Java 3 call adapter. So we adapt probably the call to RX Java. Actually, let's have a look at the call adapter itself, maybe. So, a call adapter is an interface and it adapts a call. So, the call that we've seen from the retrofit library. And with a response of type R. So, we have R, type of response, into a type of T. So, we have another type over here, which is T then instances uh, created by a factory. So we also have this call adapter and we have a factory. So if you implement your own call adapter, then you also have to implement the factory to create uh, this adapter. And then if we have a look at the implementations of it, um, what do we have here? Here we are in the tests. Um, we have some body call adapter. We have Okay, and the, the, these adapters are basically in all these factories used. And here we have our JS. Um, yeah, what is this in Scala? Okay, I don't know Scala myself, never worked with it. But we can see, quickly have a look how this implementation works, maybe. So we get the type, which is a response type. We set it to some parameter over here. And then basically what happens here, we have this adapt method that we are implementing overriding and here we get a promise ah, promise API I didn't know we have a promise API over here I know promises from JavaScript which I worked with a long time ago in this case I assume that instead of having a call um, returning a call we are returning a promise out of an interface and then we can of course call some dot then or whatever they have in this API on the promise and um, get the result later. So of course in order to be able to do it, um, promises are asynchronous, so we use call.nq because nq was asynchronous if you remember from when we looked at it. And then we have to supply some callback to it, so we are passing a new instance of a callback um, here. And then this callback has this onResponse method and in the onResponse method we are coming promise success. Okay. 
So promise success and we, then we just give it a response body. And in case of a failure, we just call promise failure and we just pass some exception to it. To this API, but in order to understand how this works, you, you will have to have a look into how promises works. And again, that's for another <laughs> video or uh, it, it's very similar also to futures in Dart. And I don't know, here is some future. What is this future? Um, it's also a Scala thingy. So maybe Scala has futures. Um, yeah, but that's basically how it will work. And I believe at this point we can uh, stop looking into this, this source code because uh, we should have some basic understanding of how Retrofit works. So we know what happens from creating the Retrofit instance, what are all these adapters, what are all these um, converters that it takes, what they do, how they work. And also we know how it basically executes the call going into the OK HTTP library and how it happens with this Retrofit calls. So with this ex execute and enqueue methods, which are synchronous and asynchronous respectively. And we also had a look a little bit into a couple of details of how Java and Android um, APIs are working over here. We've also apparently looked into a couple of design patterns. I, I really encourage you to look into this um, a bit, a little more in detail than I have had a look here with you today. Um, but if you liked it, then leave a subscribe, whatever. Um, like the video, share it, and I call you to death and I will see you the next time with maybe another boring review or boring walkthrough deep dive, whatever. Bye bye.